Welcome to OpenGov TV. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the distinct pleasure of having Dr. Geraldine Wong, who is the Chief Data Officer for GXS. We're gonna be talking about data, data analytics, and the role it's playing today in our digi world. So Geraldine, please start off by telling us a little bit about you and what got you into this amazing place that you are in right now. Hey, hi Mohit, thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, I think I have a very unique background, special journey. Um, I did a PhD in climate change and statistics, um, looking at droughts, predicting droughts. Uh, but that, that led me to a little bit more of my curiosity in using data for consumer experience as well, in developing marketing strategies for the consumers and all that. And when this, back in like close to 10 years right now, the big data exploded. Um, and you would have remembered as well, um, many of the telcos, banks would have uh, amassed all this data, not knowing what to do. And, and I thought that was the best time to take a leap into this. Um, and that's when I started my journey within big data or what you call data science right now. Um, and, and that just propelled me to different industries. Um, I think I, I was in a very lucky position of being able to be exposed in different verticals through my experience. And um, finally being able to um, lead from, from Singtel, where I used to be leading a team of data scientists and machine learning engineers to, to where I am right now. Um, and very happy to be here as well. So as we all have been saying for the last few years, not only the last few years, last decade or so, right? That data is the new oil. And you have been playing a lot with it in the AI, ML, and the predictive space. Can you tell me a little bit of some of the important lessons that you learned from that? Um, I think one, a couple of important, or maybe three important points. One is really getting um, the definitions of what AI, ML, data science mean to the business. Because as, as you go across industry, as you go, go across verticals, you would, you would have seen how many people have their own perspective to what definitions they, they hold through. Um, I think that the second question, the second point that I want to raise is also then um, people's uh, knowing with the definition, but then also translating it to how does this help the business? How does this bring value to the business? And I've been finding that um, companies or organizations have yet to grasp that full potential of the business value of how it trickles from the front end of the business down to what it means on the data quality, what it means for collection of data, what it means to model the data. Um, and a lot of times they, there is no PL attached to data yet. And that, that's, that's probably reflecting a lot of what business units think of how they're using data as well. They know it's, a, it's good to have, but it's a, not a need that I really want. It's a want versus a, a, a need, you know, if I, if I can explain it that way. I think the third important lessons that I've learned um, going through this, this journey is also about talent. Um, it's, as we all know, very hard to find the right talent. Um, even though there's so many people trying to become data scientists, data engineers, machine learning engineers, the, the, the finding the right talent for your business, right? Everyone can be a data scientist if they tell you that you get lots of CVs coming in, but how do you find the right fit? How do you right, find the people with the right skill set? And then keeping them motivated, keeping them engaged. Uh, you have, I mean, we all know about the great resignation, but um, this, this special breed of data scientists, they are so eager to try new things. Um, to, to, you know, really uh, push the boundaries. And at times, um, you, you just need to keep them engaged. And I think that's a challenge that all, I think all managers will resonate with. No, absolutely. And you're right. You know, it is a big thing about the skill set and the people that we have. And if you think about, you know, the multicultural, the cross-national national environment that we all are, basically being able to work from anywhere, anytime, you know, and you alluding to the great uh, resignation, you're right. But tell me in terms of digital information literacy, where are we going? Yeah, so, um, I mean, we, we all know that this, uh, in, in Southeast Asia it's, it's itself, there's, I think each person have actually more than one phone if you look at, if you look at the numbers, um, but yet there is very little uh, knowledge of how they are using certain apps as well. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I would like to draw the example of behavioral usage of apps, right? In, in China, we all know the super app is all within one app. In the US, it's disparate. You have multiple app, individual app. 
And I think where we're going with, it, there needs to be a cultural um, uh, flavor to developing app strategy. How do you market your product? How do you increase your engagement? And then, and why I'm saying this is because it then relates to a data sphere. For me as a CDO, how do I then collect the data? How do I map it to an individual? When you have a super app, it's going to be much more straightforward than if you have individual apps as well. Um, in terms of data privacy, trust, consent, it's also a, a cultural um, component you have to add to. How do we communicate? Because in different cultures, um, there is going to be different ways of communicating trusts, of building that trust, um, of how you you don't want to seem like you are, you're mothering them, but yet you want to be able to educate and inform them so that they have some form of digital literacy um, in terms of cybersecurity or fraud. And also about how do we give the accessibility to information? How do we make it easy for the users to, to use the apps? Um, and, and what are their expectations? It has to be always, what are they expecting out of the app that they are used to currently, that now we are bringing to a digital world and they still have that ease, they still have that familiarity as well. So Jolene, if you think about over the last two years, a lot of leaders, political leaders, made decisions without really using AI with all the immense amount of data they had available, right? So, we, so I think the first question is, do you agree that AI is an integral part okay, of daily decision-making? And if I can club that with, hey, how do you make sure that the effective approach of using data is better for your customers? Because that's what you're alluding to at the end of the day. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I agree that um, everyone really thinks that data analytics is, is should be important. Um, but as consumers, right, we are, we're always on, always connected. Um, we expect to be able to get what we need when we need it instantaneously. Um, even as we move towards a data-driven economy, um, the access to consumer data is going to be more crucial uh, for any company to maintain this competitive advantage and market leadership. So you want to be able to collect, store, manage, use this consumer data in a meaningful and ethical manner. Um, and this is a differentiating point to companies. And I think with, with the last two years of COVID, um, we're still in COVID, <laughs> there has been, I mean, accelerations in the types of data that we are being collecting. Um, and it, because more, more and more firms are pushing all their services digitally, they're engaging the consumers through all, multiple platforms. Um, so, so there is there is this need that more companies have to play in in having um, in in bringing traditional physical businesses to a digital sphere as well. Um, so, because of this, I think consumer behavior has also shifted. New habits have formed, um, where the different types of data that were collected be before before COVID is very different to how we are collecting the data right now. And and therefore, I feel like companies need to be able to foster a level a higher level of this trust. Um, the privacy and also higher standards of controls and in place in handling that. Um, in, and I think consumers are also expecting this seamless omni-channel experience where, where consumers experience and support has to be improved. Um, and the expectation of the consumers is for you to know me without having me to repeat like 10 times when I have an issue. Um, I think we are all familiar with that. Um, and also consumers are now valuing more personalized differentiated treatments. Um, what used to be deemed as personalization, so for example, personalizing your email headers with your name, now we see more personalized product recommendations, omni-channel assistance, contact center support, um, and recommendation for next best action for the consumer in a wider spectrum of consumer journey. Um, and, and therefore, companies really need to leverage on all the new forms of data to really proactively engage with consumers, even before they have the desire to buy, um, to create the consumer desire. And they need to be able to consider creating the right digital touch points. Um, and this is really a fine balance between friction and engagement and to be intentional with how they are engaging um, the, the consumer. So, so I would like to bring up a point of the rise of social community, how, how they use or leverage social communities to actually increase their engagement as well. Um, but beyond that, I, I think companies need to think about how do they do rapid experimentation? How do they foster trust? and transforming this trust into loyalty as well. And how do they grow customers through their life stage? It's not just uh, a one stop, one, one point in time life stage. I wanna be able to be able uh, journeying with you to sell you different products or to market different products and for the good of the customers as well. So um, I think the opportunities for innovating with data 
for consumer engagements uh, or for business in general is going to be immense. Um, but I also like to highlight that there's going to be a lot of risks involved and, and increasing trends towards data ethics, privacy, and security as well. And you're right. That's the internal way, Geraldine, of making sure that the inside of the company is there. But you've got over here in Singapore, you know, the Ministry of Communication and Information, who have just recently developed the Digital Trust Center, the DTC, right? And the AR Verify to establish the future of AR standards. Very, very important because, you know, that's all about governance here from a government point of view, right? So do you think this initiative could be positively impact the banks? And how do you think? Yeah, um, so maybe we start off with some genesis of, of how um, this came about as well. And, and if we've been following a lot on the um, AI journey that IMDA has also taken, I think we, it started off, well, at least um, in the recent couple of years with the model AI governance that IMDA rolled out. And, and that was to, um, it was twofold. One, to ensure that the decisions made by, the, by AI was explainable, transparent and fair to consumers. The second point was that the AI solutions would be human centric. I think building onto this, um, this initiative would definitely resonate, at least from my perspective, three different um, segments, right? Uh, or three different purposes. One, I think it will build huge trust with internal stakeholders that are leveraging some of these results, some of these models that are, are being built internally. Um, it actually makes the job easier for internal data to get the buy-in because you have a, a stand, uni universal standards being aligned um, that, that could actually help uh, drive certain of these initiatives internally. The second thing is, um, of course, winning the customer's trust. I think that's so important. Um, it would help customers understand how their data is being used internally to actually um, benefit them in, in terms of consumer engagement or whether it's protecting them from fraudulent uh, activities or risks, for example. And the third point, I think it, the, the good um, motivation that's coming out from this is also about uh, the help with collaboration um, between companies, between research institutions, higher learning institutes, for example. Um, I think the, it is important to also be able to then demonstrate to stakeholders that this implementation of responsible AI in a, is, is, is being done in an objective and verif verifiable manner. However, I think um, what's missing today, and, and I hope to see and maybe be part of involved in this, this whole discussion is also about um, how do we evaluate the performance of such models that finally lead up to the business value. And then the next question is how then do we balance off whatever we talked about in terms of AI verify this component to the business value side? Um, how do we do that balancing act as well? I think to me, that's, um, that's very important. So the volume of transactions over the, over the last few years have gone up pretty high, but so has the, the fraudulent transactions. You know. I'm also thinking from my point of view with the amount of data that we have and, and capability of AI that we can personalize messages to the different stakeholders. What's your take on all this? Yeah, I do agree with that. That's a very interesting uh, perspective to it. I, I also would like to tap upon um, the earlier question that we, you mentioned, the di digital trust center. I think with, with that coming up, uh, there's a lot of merits in, in data sharing as, as the businesses become more connected to their, to their ecosystem as well. And being able to access um, different forms of data across the, the, the ecosystem would not only help with um, exposing customers to a wide variety of services and products, but also help with protecting them from various risks and fraud um, if they share their data as well. Um, and from a data standpoint, I think with, with banks having access to these different forms of data, it's going to be much useful to, to uncover this potential fraud. But they also have to work hand in hand with, of course, your cybersecurity teams, your investigative teams as well. But I think banks would then have the challenge of having to balance customer experience, the friction, as well as um, protection of the customers. So the, the role that banks have to adopt for this um, for this education or for this um, for protecting of customers have to be clearly defined and I think it's still evolving along the way as well. All right Geraldine thanks for that let me take you from the now into the future if I may you know if you wear your future hat what does your lens show you that this industry is going to look like in the next three to five years? Yeah I think um, as I alluded to earlier and and many other questions that were um, resonating around digital trust and and data sharing, I, I do see the, the increased use of alternative data gaining traction. Um, but the key question is how do we enable this data sharing in a secure manner, 
whilst uh, ensuring that data privacy consent obligations are also being met. I think that's one of the key points and the methodology and the mode for which uh, alternative data will be used within organizations, within the ecosystem. I, I'm, I'm really excited about um, looking forward to that as well. I think the second point that I want to raise is about the rise of ethical and responsible AI. And we have seen um, IMDA come up with many frameworks on, on such um, topics, uh, MAS as well, from, from the feed principle side of things. But there's always two sides of the coin, right? One, it's going to be beneficial for the consumers to connect them with the products they love. But on the other hand, there's also going to be risk biasness associated with negative outcomes, which can cause discrimination. So then we as humans have to be in the driver's seat to determine what that balance is going to be. Um, and to me, that, that too will be my, my key focus um, for the next three to five years. No, I can see that happening. You know, and, and I wish you the very, very best on this amazing journey that you and your team have taken over. Okay, Dr. Sherilyn Wong, I thank you very much for your time. I hope this was as good for you as it was for us. Thank you, Mohit. Thank you.